get down to John DeStacio on the floor. Thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Kane, back to you. And uh, while you're kind of fired up there, let's turn to Social Security. Uh, could you be specific regarding ages, income levels? Everyone talks about reform. What is your specific, specific Social Security reform plan regard to raising the retirement age at what, at what ages, cutting benefits, and at, at what income level means testing kicking in? Thank you. Let's fix the problem and that is to restructure Social Security. I support a personal retirement account option in order to phase off the current system. We know that this works. It worked in the small country of Chile when they did it 30 years ago. Their payroll tax had gotten up to 27 percent for every dollar that the worker made. I believe we can do the same thing. That break point would be approximately 40 years of age. Now, young people realize they still got to contribute to the current system for those people that are on Social Security, that are near Social Security. Retirement age is going to be raised. Retire are you going to raise the retirement age as president of the United States? I don't have to raise the retirement age because that by itself isn't going to solve the problem. If, if Congress decides to do that, that's a different matter. Here, let me give you one other example where this approach has worked. The, the city of Galveston. They opted out of the Social Security system way back in the 70s. And now they retire with a whole lot more money. Why? For a real simple reason. They have an account with their money on it. What I'm simply saying is we've got to restructure the program using a personal retirement account option in order to eventually make it solvent. All right, we're going to keep the conversation moving. I know people want to weigh in. You'll get a chance to weigh in. Let's move down to Jennifer's on the floor with the question. Hi, John. Thank you very much. Governor Romney, I'd like to ask this to you first, please. The Treasury Department says the United States will hit its credit limit on August the 2nd. Do you believe we will ultimately have to raise the debt ceiling? I, I believe we will not raise the debt ceiling unless the president finally, finally is willing to be a leader on issues that the American people care about. And the number one issue that relates to that debt ceiling is whether the government is going to keep on spending money they don't have. And the American people and Congress and every person elected in Washington has to understand we want to see a president finally lay out plans for reining in the excesses of government. You, you've heard on here a whole series of ideas about entitlements, and that's about 60 percent of federal spending. That's a big piece. That's a big chunk. Ideas from all these people up here. Where are the president's ideas? E each, each person has different ideas here. We can try them and try different ideas in different states and different programs at the federal level, but why isn't the president leading? He isn't leading on, on balancing our budget, and he's not leading on jobs. He's failed the American people, both in job creation and Governor, in the scale of government, and that's why he's not going to be reelected. Governor, what happens if you, if you don't raise it? What happens then? Is it okay not to? Well, what, what happens if we continue to spend time and time again, year and year again, more money than, than we take in? What we say to America is, at some point, you hit a wall. At some point, people around the world say, I'm not going to keep loaning money to America to pay these massive deficits, pay for them, because America can't pay them back, and the dollar's not worth anything in them anymore. In that circumstance, we've settled our, our future, uh, the future for our kids in a way that is just unacceptable. And so you're going to see Republicans stand up and say, Mr. President, lay down plans to balance this budget. If he does so, if we get Democrats to come to the table and, and honestly deal with the challenges we have, with the entitlement challenges, with the spending and discretionary accounts, with our jobs issues, and finally say, you know what, we really can't afford another trillion dollars of Obamacare. If okay, he'll be government. honest about these things, okay. then I think you'll see the, the kind of progress right. you'd hope to see. Congresswoman Bachman, you'll get a vote on this issue. Uh, what Governor Romney outlines is the goal of Republicans, let's get a big deal to balance the budget. If you can't get that in the short term, as this date approaches, and those negotiations are continuing, what is your price tag? What is your price tag in at least a first wave of cuts? And if you don't get it, would you say to the House Republicans, no, let the government go into default. That's where we need to stand. I've already, already voted no on raising the debt ceiling in the past. And unless there are serious cuts, I can't. But I want to, I want to speak of someone who's far more eloquent than I, someone who said just dealing with the issue of raising the debt ceiling is a failure of leadership. And that person was then Senator Barack Obama. He refused to raise the debt ceiling because he said President Bush had failed in leadership. Clearly, President Obama has failed in leadership. Under his watch in two and a half years, we've increased the federal debt 35 percent just in that amount of time. So what we need to do, both from the Congress and from the president, he needs to direct his Treasury Secretary 
pay the interest on the debt first, then we won't have a failure of our full faith and credit right. from their prioritized spending. Right. We have to have serious spending cuts. Okay, appreciate that. Again, I want to ask the candidates just a little bit shorter in those answers so we can keep the voters involved. Let's go down to Josh on the floor. Thank you, John. And I'm joined by Jared Kinney, who runs a juvenile arrest unit out of Massachusetts. And I'm told that that has nothing to do with your question. Correct. <laughs> I was wondering what your definition of the separation of church and state is and how it will affect your decision making. Governor Pawlenty, why don't you take that one first? Well, the protections uh, between for the separation of church and state were designed to protect people of faith from government, not government from people of faith. And this is a country that in our founding documents says we're a nation that's founded under God and the privileges and blessings that we have are from our creator. They're not from our member of Congress. They're not from our county commissioner. And 49 of the 50 states have in the very early phrases of their constitutions language like Minnesota has in its preamble. It says this, we the people of Minnesota, grateful to God for our civil and religious liberties. And so the founding fathers understood that the blessings that we have as a nation come from our creator and we should stop and say thanks and express gratitude for that. And let's, I embrace let's, that. Let's spend some, let's, 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 let's spend a little time talking. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about it. Uh, Senator, let me start with you. Just what role does faith play in your political life? Are there decisions, certain issues where some you might just, let's meet with my advisors, what does my gut say, and others where you might retreat, have a moment of private prayer? Um, I'm someone who believes that you approach uh, issues using faith and reason. And if your faith is pure and your reason is right, they'll end up in the same place. I think the key to the success of this country, how we all live together, because we are a very diverse country. Madison called it the perfect remedy which was to allow everybody, people of faith and no faith, to come in and make their claims in the public square, to be heard, have those arguments, and not to say, because you're a person of faith, you need to stay out. Because you have strong faith convictions, your, your opinion is, is invalid. Just the opposite. We get along because we know that we all of our ideas are allowed in and are tolerated. That's what makes America work. Congressman Paul, does faith have a role in these public issues, the public square, or is it a personal issue at your home and in I, your I church? I think faith has uh, something to do with the character of the people who represent us. And law should have a moral fiber to it, and our leaders should. Uh, we shouldn't expect uh, us to uh, um, try to change morality. You can't teach people how to be moral. But the Constitution addresses this by saying, literally it says no theocracy, but it doesn't talk about uh, church and state. The most important thing is the First Amendment, the Congress shall write no laws, which means Congress should never prohibit the expression of your Christian faith in a public place. Okay, great. Let's get down. Josh McCullough, let's continue the conversation. Thank you, Good job. While we're on the topic of faith and religion, the next question goes to Mr. Kane. You recently said you would not appoint a Muslim to your cabinet, then you kind of backed off that a little bit and said that you would first want to know if they are committed to the Constitution. You expressed concern that, quote, a lot of Muslims are not totally dedicated to this country. Are American Muslims as a group less committed to the Constitution than, say, Christians or Jews? First, the statement was, would I be comfortable with the Muslim in my administration? not that I wouldn't appoint one. That's the exact transcript. And I would not be comfortable because you have peaceful Muslims and then you have militant Muslims, those that are trying to kill us. And so when I said I wouldn't be comfortable, I was thinking about the ones that are trying to kill us, number one. Secondly, yes, I do not believe in Sharia law in American courts. I believe in American laws in American courts, period. There have been instances there have, been, there have been instances in New Jersey, there was an instance in Oklahoma where Muslims did try to influence court decisions with Sharia law. I was simply saying very emphatically, American laws and American courts. Uh, so on that point, Governor Romney, let me come to you on this one. On that point, what Mr. Kane is saying that he would have, what my term, not his, a purity test or a loyalty test. He would want to ask a Muslim a question or a few questions before he hired them but he wouldn't ask those questions of a Christian you, or a uh, Jew. Sorry. That, no, you are restating something that I did not say, okay? okay? If I may, okay? Let's make, please, let's make it clear. When you interview a person for a job, you look at their, you look at their work record, you look at their resume, and then you have a one-on-one -on -one personal right. interview. Right. During right. that personal interview, 
like in the business world or anywhere else, you are able to get a feeling for how committed that person is to the Constitution, how committed they are to the mission of the organization. But you when, can I asked, when I asked you this question the other night, though, you said that you would want to ask a Muslim those questions, but you didn't think you would have to ask them to a Christian or a Jew. I would ask certain questions, John, and it's not a litmus test. It is simply trying to make sure that we have people committed to the Constitution first in order for them to work effectively in the administration. Should one segment, Governor Romney, one segment of Americans, in this case, religion, but in any case, should one segment be singled out, treated differently? Well, well but first of all, of course, we're not going to have Sharia law applied in U.S. courts. That's never going to happen. We have a constitution. We follow the law. Um, no, I, I think we recognize that the people of all faiths are welcome in this country. Our nation was founded on a principle of religious tolerance. It's in fact why, uh, why some of the early patriots came to this country. And, uh, and we treat people with respect regardless of their religious persuasion. Uh, obviously anybody who would come into my administration would be someone who I knew, who I was comfortable with, and who I believed would honor as their highest oath, their oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. Right. Mr. Speaker, go ahead. I, I just want to comment for a second. You know, the Pakistani who emigrated to the U.S., became a citizen, built a car bomb, which luckily failed to go off in Times Square, was asked by the federal judge, how could he have done that when he signed and when he swore an oath to the United States? And he looked at the judge and he said, you're my enemy. I lied. Now, I just want to go out on a limb here. I am in favor of saying to people, if you're not prepared to be loyal to the United States, you will not serve in my administration, period. Amen. All right, well, we did this, we did this in dealing with the Nazis, and we did this in dealing with the communists, and it was controversial both times, and both times we discovered after a while, you know, there are some genuinely bad people who would like right. to infiltrate right. our country, and we have got to have the guts to stand up and say no. All right, we're going to work in another break. So a lot more ground to cover with our seven Republican candidates for president today. Voters here in New Hampshire asking the questions. You can help us at home on Facebook and on Twitter. Please send in your suggestions. In and out of every break, we're asking a candidate more of a personal question, this or that, to make a choice. Mr. Kane, deep dish or thin crust? <laughs> deep dish. <laughs> deep dish it is. Our seven candidates for the Republican presidential nomination will be right back. Oh.